We're starting a brand new series. This one is about time. You know, I think a lot of us have a love-hate kind of relationship with time. Uh, sometimes time goes way too fast. I'm you know, recording this at a point in time when we think we're coming up on the backstretch of the pandemic, and many of us have been looking forward for a long time to gathering with friends and family again, and, and I'm sure that when we actually have that opportunity, the time will go way too fast. But at the same time, sometimes time goes way too slowly. Hopefully that isn't the case during this sermon, but it could possibly be. A friend of mine says this, he says, the, the days crawl and the years fly. Uh, time, yeah, sometimes it goes fast, sometimes it seems to go too slowly. Some people never have enough time, and so if, when you heard me say, I'm starting a new series about time, you might be hoping that I will have something helpful to say to you, because you just never seem to have enough time, and so you're looking for that one time management tip, that life hack that would really help uh, some of us just never have enough time. So in this series, we're going to get help from the creator and inventor of time himself, God. In week three of the series, we'll consider what is probably the greatest time-saving hack ever. Uh, and in week four, we're going to look at how to make time use choices. But today, I want to think about time itself. Have you ever thought about what an amazing creation time is? You know, God created the sun, and we love that. I'm looking forward to being out in the sun a little later and, and spending more time in that nice warm sun as spring and summer approach. The sun is an amazing created thing by God. Uh, water is an amazing creation, right? It's the universal solvent. It, it can quench our thirst. It can do so many things for us. What an amazing creation water is. What about time? It's an amazing creation as well. God created time. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, the beginning of time that is, not the beginning of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was a morning, one day. And boom, just like that, time had been created by God. And then later, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars so that we could keep track of time. You find that in verses 14 to 17. Now, as you consider this idea that God created time, there are so many fascinating, mind-bending rabbit trails that we could chase. Uh, let's go down one. It'll be kind of fun. I want you to take a look uh, at this pencil. All right? Take a good look at the pencil. Uh, and as you're looking at the pencil, I, I want you to think, what part of the pencil is easier for you to see? The, the tip of the pencil, the, the middle, of the, the barrel or the body of the pencil, or the end, the eraser end? What, which part is easier for you to see? Now, if you're a little confused right now and you're thinking, what, Pastor Andy, what? I can see it all. Then you're on the right track. That's exactly what you should be thinking right now. Yeah, you're outside of the pencil, right? You, so you can see it all equally well. You can see the, the tip. You can see the body of it. You can see the, the other end, the eraser end, all at the same time. But if somehow we were able to get that device from the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and we were able to shrink you down, and you were tiny and you were placed on the pencil, then this question would be totally different, wouldn't it? Then you could only see well the maybe the part that's right next to you or, or right in front of you. Or if we could shrink you farther and put you inside the pencil, you'd only be able to see just a little bit of it. But you're not in the pencil and you're not on the pencil. You are outside the pencil. And so you can see it all at the same time, all equally well. That's how God is with time. God created time. And he's outside of time, just like you're outside this pencil. And he can see it all at the same time, all equally well. Your past, your present, your future, he can see it all at once because he's not in time. He's outside of time. He's the creator of time. Fascinating, mind-bending stuff, isn't it? Uh, as I think, too, about how God created time, he, he created it, I believe, for a purpose. We'll talk about that uh, today, too. But if God created it for a purpose, 
Well, then that means that someday God may do away with time once it no longer has a purpose. We don't believe that the sun will exist uh, in heaven because it's not needed anymore. God himself and his glory will be the light. The same thing happened with time, possibly. That's crazy to think about. And, and then you wonder, like, all right, so is eternity, is eternity like when there is no more time? Or is eternity like limitless time? We don't know. I hope to, I'll find out someday. Uh, but, and I could tell you then, but, but then you won't care. So why did God create time? If he made it and he made it for us, why did he create it? Well, I'm sure there are a number of reasons, but one that I want to camp on today is to help us know where we are in his story. You know, like, are we, are we before uh, the, the, the first coming of Jesus or the second coming of Jesus? Are, are we in between them? Are we before this? Are we after that? Uh, you can imagine how crazy and confusing it would be if we didn't know where we are in God's story. If you've ever been lost, you have a, a feel for this. Imagine being lost in time or lost in the story, not knowing where we are. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Ah, at the right time, Jesus died. At the right time in the story. Uh, and notice this, he died, that's past tense. So we're after Jesus' death on the cross, right? We know that. That wasn't a shock to you. But imagine if we didn't have time, we didn't have a way to know where we were in that story. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5 says, So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will bring uh, to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the hearts, and then praise will come to each one from God. See, at the right time, God will reveal and judge. Okay, so we're after the death on the cross, but we're before judgment day. That's where we are in the story. Now, knowing where we are in the story is more than interesting. It's practical because it helps us to know what acts of God we should celebrate and apply the results to our lives, and, and which acts of God we're still waiting for and are therefore part of our hope for a better future. So for example, we're living after Jesus bled on the cross to ratify the new covenant. So therefore, that means we have, in the present, a new purity, a new heart, new desires, new power, new identity. But when those things were written about, when Jeremiah wrote those things, he was living before Jesus had died on the cross and the new covenant was not into effect yet. And so he couldn't stand up and, and say to the people in his day, hey, look, you have a new purity. You have a new heart. So live like you have new desires because you really already have those things and you have the Holy Spirit in you and a new identity. He couldn't say that to them. He could just say, look, the day is coming when those things will be ours. So let's live with hope in the present. But he couldn't live with those blessings in the present. So knowing where we are in the story helps us know which promises to claim versus which promises to cling to for a better future. The biblical view of time that we're all familiar with uh, and, and that I'm talking about today is, you know, time had a beginning and it's moving towards a destination as God is working out his story. That's not new to us, but it was radically different from the other ideas about time. Uh, for example, the Greeks thought of time as a circle that repeated. And th there's reason why they probably thought that history does seem to have a way of repeating itself, but they thought of it just as an endless cycle. Uh, there's evidence that other uh, Old Testament People, perhaps Solomon thought a similar kind of way that time was kind of like a, a circle that repeated. But this whole thing that you and I know that time had a beginning and is moving toward a destination means that life is more than an existence to be endured. We're part of a story, and we're part of a story that's going somewhere. And so we live with hope. One more thing on this topic before we move on. Since time is God's creation to help us know where we are in his story, that means it's his story and not ours. And life is not all about us and our story. And so we should live with humility. Okay, so God created and gave us the gift of time. But secondly, God placed us both within time and eternity. We were born simultaneously into both time. Think, think of a line segment. It has a beginning and an end. We were born into time. A line segment. 
segment, but we're also born into eternity. Think of that as being like an arrow or a ray where it has a beginning, but then it continues on forever. We were born simultaneously into both time and eternity. They are separate entities, time and eternity, but they are connected in that they affect each other. Our time use affects eternity, doesn't it? And eternity is meant to affect how we use our time. Let's talk about the first one. Our time use affects eternity. Our actions during time have consequences that last for eternity, after time, right? There are many Bible passages that teach this principle. For example, the the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, or Matthew 25, 2 Corinthians 5.10, Revelation 22, 12 through 15. Our choices, our real choices, they're real because they have real consequences. What we do (laughs) when we choose something affects the future. So our choices are real. We'll talk more about that next week. So eternity... Uh, should also affect our time use. We, we said that time use affects eternity. It goes the other way. Eternity should affect our time use. And it does this in at least two ways. Uh, one, it affects our preparations for the future. In, in Luke 12, we read about the parable of, of the rich farmer who was planning for the future but didn't plan for far enough in the future. Let's jump in. Jesus then told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. And he thought to himself, well, what should I do? Since I don't have anywhere to store my crops, uh, I will do this, he said. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, You have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. This rich man had an amazingly productive crop, and he thought to himself, I I need to be smart about this. I need to be wise. I need to be proactive. I need to plan for the future. How can I guard my nest egg? And so he thought it through, and he decided to invest and he, he, he did it. I mean, he tore down his barns and invested in bigger barns so he'd have more storage capability so he could keep all of his stuff and ration it out. And he had a plan. Most of us would look at this guy and say, wow, there's a guy who was really thinking it through. I mean, he wasn't lazy and he wasn't foolish. He, he planted at the right time. He, he probably cultivated his crops the right way. Now, God was the one who gave him the bumper crop, but he had done... Uh, very proactive things. He was smart. He was wise. Now look how Jesus responds and com- comments about this guy. But God said to him, you fool. You fool. You. God didn't look at him and thought, think he was wise at all. God said, you are a fool. In other words, you're one who should know better, but you didn't. You didn't act wisely. You are a fool, even though you should know better than this. And he explains why. He said, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things that you've prepared, whose will they be? And God's saying to us, look, you're a fool if you don't plan for your never-ending future. If during your time on earth, all you plan for is the line segment part. If you use your time and only plan for while you're in the present up through the end of your time, the end of your line segment, you are a fool because you are also living in eternity, your never-ending future. And if you do not plan and you do not prepare for your never-ending future, you have not thought far enough in advance. Another way to say it is this. Any sensible time management system must take eternity into account. I'm a bit of a nerd, I suppose, in this area of time management systems. I've read a bunch of books, and I've tried a whole lot of different ways. I've I've had a planner. Uh, I use a calendar. I use the Eisenhower matrix, and so every week I sit down, and I take all the things off my calendar and all the projects I'm working on, and I plot them out on the Eisenhower matrix, and and, and then uh, I... uh, I make pretty heavy use of post-it notes. You can see some here on the inside. This is my daily one. And, and I keep a, a small sampling of projects and 
the one side of the ones I'm working on now and the other ones are the ones that I'm in the planning or preparing or praying for stage. And so, you know, and all that's great and it's productive and it, and it works most of the time for me. But here's what Jesus would say to me, Andy, if your projects and your planning is only based in the stuff that's going to take place here, and you do not take eternity into account, Andy, you, you're not preparing for far enough in the future. And that would make you a fool. So clearly, e eternity is meant to affect our perspective uh, on the present. There's another way that it helps us in, in that it gives us perspective on, on our present efforts to accumulate money and possessions. This ties right in with what we just looked at. But, but Paul wrote uh, a letter to his apprentice, Timothy. And in chapter six of that first letter, he said this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. He's just talked about some others who were looking for a way to, to gain, to, to really get ahead in life. And Paul contrasts that and says, no, really the way to get ahead, Timothy, is godliness combined with contentment. That's great gain. And then he continues, verse seven, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Yeah, when, you're, when your line segment life, when your time is up, you can't take anything, any possessions you've got here and then use them in the infinity part, in the eternity part of life. So he says, what do we do about that? Well, verse eight, but if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap that many foolish and harmful desires that, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith, from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul says, Timothy, let, let me give you some perspective on the present desire that most people have to accumulate more stuff. Let me give you some perspective, but that perspective is going to come from eternity. And here's that perspective. Contentment is more valuable than stuff. Stated another way, T Timothy, if you can get only one thing to add to your godliness, if you can have one thing, it's probably not, you know, a, a 401k account or an IRA or a nice car or whatever. If you can have only one thing, if you want something that's amazingly valuable, pick contentment. Because <laughs> contentment, when combined with godliness, is so helpful to you. It's protective. You saw that in the verses we read. But then a little later, he adds some more uh, to this idea of why contentment is such a great thing. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. There's another reason why contentment is so awesome. With contentment, we enjoy the things that God provides. You ever met somebody who had a ton and enjoyed it very little? They had far more blessings, far more uh, possessions, far more just great things in their life than you did, and yet they didn't seem to enjoy any of it. Contentment is the secret to enjoyment. Verse 18, Paul continues, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that may, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This perspective that we're supposed to have, that contentment is incredibly valuable, and that perspective that we get from eternity helps us in the present. It helps us to enjoy our stuff in the present, to enjoy the simple routines of life and, and, and you know, and food. Uh, it helps us so much in that way. It helps us to, to enjoy our stuff. It helps us in that it leads us to treasure and it helps us by leading us to what is truly life. So eternity affects our perspective on the present. It also uh, helps us by giving us perspective on our present sufferings caused by living out our faith. I, I wish I didn't have to tell you this next part, but I have to because Pastor Joel just finished uh, an incredible series about living on mission. And, and I need to tell you, if you live intentionally 
And if you're serious about being on mission and doing the things that Pastor Joel challenged us to do in those five parts of that series, you will suffer. Now, it, it probably won't be in, in overt ways. You, you know, It's not likely that some bully is going to come beat you up because you were witnessing uh, to the amazing changes that God has done in your life. That's probably not going to happen. It's more likely if you get beat up by somebody for witnessing is probably because you were witnessing in an aggressive way. Could, it could not be the case, but, but probably... No, it's probably you're going to suffer in, in more subtle ways that are hard to put your finger on. It's hard to recognize that there is suffering or persecution because it, instead of it being outright, you know, bold, like you're getting this because you're a Christian, it'll be subtle things like there's more drama at school or more drama at home or, or it just seems to be a lot more drama at work, you know, something like that. Or things just kind of seem to be breaking more than normal. Things are, are wearing out or, or breaking down. And, and so it's just really irritating. And, and so you're suffering in a way that's hard to say, oh, wait, is that, is that actual persecution or not? It, Paul, I told you, wrote a letter to his apprentice, Timothy. He wrote a second one, and we have it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. He said, but know this, Timothy, Hard times will come in the last days. And then in verse 10, Paul said to Timothy, but you followed my teaching, and my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, love, and endurance, all along uh, with the persecutions and sufferings that have come to, came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What well, persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. Paul said, Timothy, you, you've tracked my life, you, you've seen how I've lived, and you saw that I suffered persecutions and other kinds of suffering. Now, if it just ended right there, we'd all probably breathe a huge sigh of relief and say, God, thank you so much that I am not Paul. But Paul continued, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's not just Paul. Everyone who lives it out will suffer, whether you're an adult, or a teen, or a kid. Everyone who attempts to attempts to truly live out their faith will suffer. So, well, that's not so great, right? But how, so, how, how does our knowledge of eternity help? Well, it helps in this way. It gives us this perspective that it, it reminds us that the prize is worth the pain. The prize is worth the pain. Paul again, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 wrote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, right, the suffering present time, are, are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The sufferings of the, the present world, this time right here, are not worthy to be compared with the glories of the coming time, the coming world, the, the rest of eternity. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 32, remember, the writer says, remember as in right now in the present, remember the past, the earlier days when after you'd been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. At other times, you were companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathize with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions because you know that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. These people that the author is writing to have been through a wave of persecution and suffering, came out of that, and now they're in another one. And he says, remember how you endured the previous one and you, and you put up with it. Do you remember how you put up with it? <laughs> because you knew that you had a better and enduring possession. So verse 35, he says, so don't throw away your confidence, which is a great reward. For you need endurance so that after you've done God's will, you may receive what is promised. He says, persevere, right? Persevere in the present so that you can receive the reward that never ends in eternity. So what a gift. What an amazing gift this thing is called time. That God created for us. He created it. He created it for a purpose. And then he placed us in time and in eternity simultaneously. As we think about that, we want to live with hope. You are part of a story that is going somewhere. This is not just an existence. 
And, and you want to live with humility. It is his story, not yours. And you want to live wisely, preparing for the future. And you want to live with a healthy perspective on the present. Enjoy the good gifts you have in the present. And don't let the sufferings of the present make you quit on your faith. Next week, we're going to talk some more about time and why did God give us only just so much of it. We'll see you then.